Thank, thank you, Alyssa. Next up, Jim Andrews, Amphibians and Reptiles. As you know, um, not all the amphibians and reptiles that we have are forest species. We have a lot of edge species. We have species that are primarily aquatic. Um, we have some grassland species. And most of them actually depend on connectivity between two or three or more types of habitat. And they need the ability to move between habitats uh, one of which is the forested habitat that we're talking about today. Um, you've heard, I'm sure, that internationally there's been tremendous declines in populations of amphibians, largely due to chytrid fungus. Um, and the good news is that, that in Vermont we have not seen chytrid fungus drop populations like it has in other parts of the world. Those declines have been primarily Central America, um, Southwestern United States, Australia, some other places, but not so much here. We have had chytrid here uh, as a result of studies of amphibians in uh, museum collections. We've had chytrid here for, for many decades, at least a strain of chytrid. Um, we have had one species entirely disappear. The boreal chorus frog was last seen in Vermont in 1999, and sadly we don't know why that species disappeared. I don't think it has anything to do with forest health. That's primarily a, an edge and a lowland species. Um, it could have to do with many of the other factors that people here have talked about, but um, that's also declined in, in Quebec and, and eastern Ontario as, as well. Um, we certainly have some other declines that, that have taken place uh, in edge species, but I'll try to, to move toward the discussion of forest health um, to keep in line with, with the focus of today's uh, theme. But as you can see here, um, we have two types of, of monitoring going on. We have intensive monitoring. And we have two locations that, that we set up intensive monitoring in using drift fences. One was Mount Mansfield and one was Lye Brook near Manchester. And both those were chosen as a result of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative's uh, data collection. So they had a collection site uh, and do have a collection site, as you've heard about, Proctor Maple Research Center on Mount Mansfield. And the other one is, is near Lye Brook. Um, sadly, um, uh, the funding our funding at, at, at uh, Live Brook ran out. We got funding for a number of years from Green Mountain National Forest. And then that ended. And then we had funding still for Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. And we would move between Mount Mansfield and Live Brook to get data. Um, but that funding has been trimmed to the point where we, uh, I removed those fences last year. Uh, but uh, hopeful that we can get those fences up and, and going again in the future. But we also have the extensive monitoring going, which is, a, is a, quite a different type of project. I really would like to have photo vouchers of all reptiles and amphibians from every single town in Vermont. So that if some town asks me, I mean, what, what species, if some conservation commission asks me, what species do I have in this town, I can give them a list and I can show them the pictures. And we're still working on that. We've been working on that for 25 years. Um, we're still working on that, and VMC has been a major uh, funder of that project as well. So I want to look at some charts from the intensive monitoring. Right here, let's take a look at spring peeper. You can see two species up there. You can see wood frog on top. And wood frog populations bounce around a lot. Uh, so that we're not really seeing a meaningful trend here. But when we look at this particular line, for spring peepers, it got to the point where there were a number of years where we couldn't find any spring peepers at our fences at all. And so that was a pretty clear decline and you know, a little quick bounce back. And then you could see our last year here of data, 2014. Uh, real interested in what's going on there. But remember, these data are strictly from 
um, Mount Mansfield, so that then if we spring down to Lye Brook and we look at Peeper, which is this one, and we look at 2008, which was when they entirely disappeared from Mount Mansfield, at, at Lye Brook, they had a great year. Um, so there are a number of factors. These, the different species that we're looking at are, are dependent on different habitats. Some of them uh, don't use uh, wetland breeding sites at all, some do. And, and it's our hope that by looking at a variety of species, and, and if we see declines in some species but not others, we could take that life cycle and habitat need uh, into consideration when we try to figure out what the causes are. Also, um, I may not be able to figure out what causes declines in particular species, but the benefit of being a monitoring cooperative is that as I sit here and listen to other people talk, um, I can then say, hey, geez, may maybe it's uh, one of these other soil factors or one of, the one of these other chemical factors that some of these other experts uh, bring to our attention. So that really the value of having a variety of people collecting data uh, at the same site is tremendous and tremendously helpful to me and I hope to them. Um, so if we look at a couple other things, this is Mount Mansfield, this is a red-backed salamander. This is a common species statewide and um, I should mention that for this kind of statewide data, um, many people in here have contributed to that atlas. Many organizations represented here have contributed to that atlas. That is nothing that I could have done by myself. Fish and Wildlife has been tremendously helpful. Um, county foresters, uh, volunteers, my students, uh, slaves, if I could get them, um, get out there and get a good grade and find me a new species. Some people in here have heard me say that. Um, so anyhow, this tremendous increase uh, of redback salamanders, there's no question about that at, um, at the Proctor Maple Research Center site. So that species does not, it, it is our only salamander species that does not use a wetland. So that has nothing to do with wetland health, wetland distribution. That's a soil salamander. It overwinters below the frost line. It's not a freeze tolerant species. Um, and as you can see, it's a pretty, pretty common species statewide. And these little white towns that you see are, are, are only white, not because they don't have redback salamanders, it's just because I haven't gotten somebody in that community to go out and take a picture of one and send it to me. It would be fairly, it, it shouldn't take more than a day to document uh, a redback salamander from those towns. But, so what could be going on here? Um, I know that uh, redback salamanders are very pH sensitive and they disappear when the pH of soils gets below a certain point. So potentially this could relate to pH of soils. It could also relate to maturity of the forest or depth of deciduous leaf litter. Depth of deciduous leaf, leaf litter is a concern and you'll hear other people talk about it later today because of the introduced worm species now. That, that are showing up here, a wide variety of, of worm species, some very invasive, and uh, you know, munching away at that leaf litter and, and, and reducing it. But these guys are increasing. So despite the fact that we are now getting worms at, at Proctor Maple Research Center, and we just started gathering data on the worms that show up on our fences as well, um, despite that fact that the worms are showing up, these guys are still increasing tremendously. Um, my guess would be that that is a result, but this is just a guess here. The data clearly tell us there's an increase, but in terms of what's causing that, causing that increase, could be pH, could be the maturity uh, of the forest as they mature at that site, which was once cleared. So then if we, um, so then if we move and look at that same species, P. cenarius, which is a red-backed salamander, at Lye Brook, we don't, we haven't seen that increase at that site. One of the tremendous advantages of having a couple monitoring sites so that we can say, okay, is this a, a localized event or is this a regional event? It's just, it, we haven't seen that increase there. Why um, are the soils taking longer to recover from the pH uh, issue? Maybe um, the, the woods are maturing. Um, 
I'm not sure what's causing that, but working with others that are looking at other factors is tremendously helpful. So here I pick one species. This is from taking a map from our statewide monitoring Jefferson salamander group because it hybridizes and, and you often see the hybrids as well. But Jefferson salamander is pretty pH sensitive and it's a valley species. This is Champlain Basin and continuing down here. And I, and I pick this one uh, because it definitely used forests. It's one of the more dependent on forests, but not just forests, but neutral pH ponds as well. So we've heard a variety of figures here today about habitat loss. This particular figure that I'm using actually came from a graduate student at uh, the Gund Institute, UVM, and 75 square miles uh, per decade being lost. Uh, and that's not just forests, though. That's the other types of habitat that we're talking about. Um, old field, edge habitat, wetlands, etc. But clearly, whatever this figure is, whether it's 75 or 10 or 4, it's going down. It does seem to have come down in the last couple decades. But whatever that figure is, if there is a net loss of habitat per decade, then of course we're going to see more species have more issues and we're going to have connectivity problems and we're going to have uh, ecosystem services decline, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to bring that to a zero net loss. And it's kind of a, a, a radical thing, politically speaking, to say, but um, we've got to get to that point. So you've probably seen variations of this particular uh, formula where our environmental impact as a species has to do with our, is driven by our population times the resources per capita times some sort of efficiency factor. You've probably seen some variation of that. And if you just consider uh, energy there, um, okay, if we work on going to maybe 50% renewable energy, we're working on this factor, and that's tremendously important. But if at the same time our energy use per person continues to go up and the population, world population continues to go up, then we're going to wipe out these improvements that we're making in efficiency. And so I like to continually point out on the larger scale that we've got to be looking at these two, the amount of resources used per capita and world population at the same time. And we have to embrace it. I mean, now we're seeing populations start to stabilize in Vermont, but we're seeing people complain about it. But I think it's up to us who know that that has to happen to say, yeah, this is a good thing. We have to adjust to it. There'll be some economic adjustments we have to make, but this has to happen. It's good. Let's move forward. So these are some of the, uh, the important funders that I've had over the years. I'm tremendously thankful for, for the help from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Vermont Modern Cooperative, Lintel Hack Foundation, and uh, Norcross Foundation out of New York State. Thank you very much. <laughs>